Welcome, everyone, to the 16th Goodman Lecture presented by Kensei Foundation. My name is Trent Walker. I'll be your host today. I'm currently a member of the Kensei Foundation Academic Development Committee and also a postdoc at the Ho Center for Buddhist Studies at Stanford. Today's event, as you all know, features a lecture by Dr. Mark Allen of the University of Sydney on Buddhism in Gand ancient Gandhara and recent manuscript discoveries. Most of you who have been attending these events are already familiar with Kensei Foundation and the Goodman Lectures. In case you aren't, I invite you to check out www.kenseifoundation.org to learn more. We'll have a period of dis discussion after Dr. Allen's talk. And as I mentioned before, to ask a question, please submit it to KFQ&A via the chat feature over Zoom. And then I'll be able to pose selected questions directly to our speaker. It's such a pleasure to have this series of talks uh, featuring scholars from the many universities that Kensei Foundation partners with across the world. And one of those universities is the University of Sydney. And some of you may have heard recently, this, uh, beginning this past summer, that Kensei Foundation has entered into an agreement with the University of Sydney to support the teaching of Tibetan Buddhism there over the next uh, 20 years. And this is a position that Kensei Foundation was already cooperating with other organizations uh, to fund, but we're really delighted that we can be a part of making the long-term future of Buddhist studies at the University of Sydney become a reality. And those of you who are familiar with the work of Dr. Mark Allen, of Dr. Chu Hui Ho, of Dr. Uh, Jim Reingens, and others who teach courses related to Buddhist studies at the University of Sydney, you know that this is one of the leading universities in the world for research and teaching in Buddhist studies. So it's a real pleasure to be able to have uh, Dr. Mark Allen with us uh, today to be able to give a lecture sharing on some of his most recent research that engages with Gandharan Buddhist manuscripts. Before, uh, before we begin, I just wanted to say a few words about uh, Dr. Allen and some of his work and what his research has meant to the fields of Buddhist studies. His, his first book uh, called Style and Function, a study of the dominant stylistic features of the prose portions of Pali canonical uh, sutta texts and their mnemonic function was really a watershed moment in the, the study of Pali texts in the Tipitaka, particularly how to make sense of the kinds of stock phrases or formulas in those texts, how to make sense of the way words are arranged, how to make sense of the many different kinds of repetitions we see in these texts. And for all of us who are familiar with reading a Buddhist uh, scriptural material, whether from the Pali tradition or from uh, other Buddhist traditions, that these kinds of stylistic features are really essential to understand what's happening in the text. Some of you may remember in last uh, month's lecture by Professor Paul Harrison of Stanford University, he mentioned this waxing syllable principle as being one of the uh, features that really guided some of his approach to the translation of the Vimarakirti Nirdesha along with uh, Professor Luis Gomez. And this uh, waxing syllable principle is in fact something that was coined uh, by Dr. Mark Allen in his work. Um, the most sort of recent instantiation of some of the ideas explored in that 1997 monograph are in this uh, book just uh, released, I think in 2021, if I'm remembering correctly, the composition and transmission of early Buddhist texts with specific reference to sutras. And this book really expands the scope of uh, Alan's earlier work that had focused particularly on Pali material, to encompass the whole range of early Buddhist textual production, whether texts that survive in Sanskrit, in Gandhari, in Chinese, in Pali, and other early Buddhist languages, uh, and showing not only the extension of some of the key arguments he raised, but really uh, showing how this could function in this broader realm. And 
This, of course, is connected to what we'll hear about today from, uh, from Dr. Allen, that is from his other area of research that really focuses on the Gandharan textual material. So I know we'll be hearing more about this uh, today from, from Dr. Allen, but if you're not familiar already with the Journal of Gandhari Buddhist Texts um, or with uh, some of Mark Allen's publications, you can find um, on Mark Allen's uh, academia.edu page many of the uh, of his research publications are available freely to download. Uh, this book that just came out through the Hamburg Buddhist Studies series is now uh, available uh, freely as an open access uh, PDF through the publisher as well. So there's lots of ways for us all to be able to engage with some of the, the many contributions that uh, Dr. Allen has brought to, to Buddhist studies. So I won't say more about the exciting uh, work in Kantari studies because that will be the subject of today's talk. But without further ado, again, I'd really like to thank you, Dr. Allen, for uh, joining us today and for sharing uh, on uh, the subject of Buddhism and ancient Gandhara and recent manuscript discoveries. Thank you very much. I better put on my mic. Um, thank you, Trent, and thank you to the Kenta Foundation for hosting my talk. It's, it's a fantastic series. So I'll share screens. Let's see. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. So I'm great. going to do this. So as Trent said, I want to talk about Buddhism in ancient Gandhara, and I'll explain where that is in a moment, and new manuscript finds and what these finds are telling us. Um, <clears throat> so the region we're talking about is northern Pakistan, eastern Afghanistan, and it was often referred to as the crossroads of Asia because it's here that, you know, cultures, major civilizations interacted. This is where, you know, South Asia, India interacts with Central Asia, but particularly China and with the trade routes along the Silk Route and then with the Mediterranean world and so on. Um, Gandhara itself sits in this region here, Afghanistan, as I said, eastern Afghanistan, northern Pakistan, particularly centered on uh, Peshawar. So Gandhara comes into sort of European Western consciousness really with uh, Alexander of Macedon or Alexander the Great conquers all of the Persian Empire. Now the Persian Empire came right up to this region, occupied Gandhara 600 to 400 BC and then uh, the Greeks take it from him. Um, and you know, as a consequence, we actually get Greek cities in this region. So this is a very famous one, Iconum in northern Bactria, um, which, you know, you will find Greek temples, you know, Greek inscriptions, Greek artwork, and so on. This, you, as you will see, has an impact on Gandhara. Um, now, what we know of Buddhism being introduced into the region, we think that it was introduced under the Mauryan Empire, that's, you know, sort of under Ashoka, the great emperor, Ashoka, third century BC, who um, expands the Mauryan Empire to its greatest extent, at which includes Gandhara. So we find sites like this. This is the Dhammarajika Stupa in uh, Taxila in Pakistan. What you're seeing is not that period, but the foundations is of that period. This is a classic Buddhist monastery that's centered on a stupa. Um, you know, Ashoka sends out inscriptions throughout his realm in a Prakrit language. Um, but in Gandhara, they're translated into Gandhari language, which we'll talk about in a minute. He also sent out bilingual inscriptions, so Aramaic, speaking to the remnants of the Persian Empire and Greek in that area, speaking to the, to the Greeks. So it's, you know, multi-ethnic um, cultural region. Um, he also sent out some of what he refers to as commissioners dharmas uh, of, of the dharma or law throughout his realm. So it's said that under Ashoka, his son, um, um, went down to um, Sri Lanka and introduced Buddhism to Sri Lanka and so up into the northeast. And he was interacting with, with Greek kings. Um, you know, so we have Indo-Greek kingdoms in this area, but very importantly for the spread of Buddhism, especially to Central Asia and China, is the Kushan Empire. That's sort of first of century, third century of the common era. All of northern India, Bactria and parts of Central Asia they were interacting with the per, with the Parthian Empire and the Roman Empire, you know, both in trade and, and so on. Um, now, 
the Buddhist heritage of this region, Afghanistan, Pakistan, comes into European Western consciousness through the, in the colonial period. Charles Masson, the deserter from the British Army, went up into this region, discovered all these sites, started digging them, and you know things like this reliquaries were sent back to the British Museum, etc. Um, so this is the beginning of you know the outside world's understanding, particularly Western European knowledge of it. You know now this you know brought about this study of this region. And it was revealed that basically, you know, you're looking at a very rich Buddhist heritage for about a thousand years, beginning with the Shoka onwards. You know, you leave behind these fantastic sites like this, Tattvahi Monastery, um, you know, which, and this classic sort of, you know, colonial era archaeological finds, you would dig up all these amazing artworks, a lot went, ended up in the British uh, Museum. And then also it started an antiquities trade and a lot of this the material went in onto the antiquities market. You also get a huge um, uh, important site such as Bamiyan, um, which we know was infamous through the Taliban blowing up the Buddhas, unfortunately, a major Buddhist site, which comes into our story of manuscripts later. But, you know, as is typical of many Buddhist communities, um, the realm of, so we know that the Buddha historically is unlikely to have gone to that area. It was just outside his area of, of uh, wanderings. You know, his area sat in the Gangetic Plains. But stories that were set originally in the Gangetic Plains came to be set also in Gandhara. So the Buddha's taming of the Naga serpent Apalala, which happened in Magadha, actually also occurs in the northwest. Um, and, you know, we have these giant footprints which record that, you know, after he, uh, he tamed Apalala, um, he left his footprints in the mud in the river, and this is it. And the Chinese pilgrims who come through this area from about the 5th century of the Common Era onwards see these sites. And, in fact, they come to these sites, these holy sites, as part of a pilgrimage, right? So that is, um, you know, it's, it's now, it becomes very quickly a Buddhist land. Similarly, the past lives of the Buddha to be, what are called Jatakas, uh, you know, many of them got set in Gandhara as well. So, you know, the area becomes part of the Holy Land. Similarly, there was a very, you know, it's happening all over the Buddhist world, but a rich tradition of, of um, installing or creating Buddhist monasteries and the presence of Buddhism through relics of the Buddha in lands where formerly there was no Buddhism. It's a long you know, a long, has a long history of this practice. Gandhara, there's many uh, sort of inscriptions recording this. It was a very meritorious act. So what, you know, Buddhists was doing is it's expanding the Holy Land. And as far as the Chinese Buddhists, you know, pilgrims are concerned, it is part of that Buddhist Holy Land. Um, now, relics, very important in the Buddhist tradition. We know that when the Buddha died, he was cremated and his relics were distributed through the various local, you know, groups. Um, and part of that relics is the interring of those relics in what's called a stupa, a monument like this. This is one of the earliest we have in India, beautiful site. Um, you know, the presence of the relics of the Buddha, whether it's bone, teeth, ash, and so on, make that space powerful and holy. They bring the presence of the Buddha to that space. Um, and, you know, this, there was appropriate behaviour around that stupa worship. It's, you know, central to Buddhist practice. The presence of stupas in Buddhist lands, pagodas, chedis, it, you know, it marks Buddhist lands, really. Um, you know, as I saw, you know, you have reliquaries like this that were or, you know, relics of the Buddha were interred in these stupas or like this, the Senavarma, along with you know, precious things which mark, mark the significance of the, the um, interment of the, the relics. But you also have relics in the form of things the Buddha used. So his bowl, for example, which was given to him by the, the gods of the four direction, becomes an object of uh, worship and veneration. And in fact, it was um, said to have been taken by the great Kushan emperor from the lowlands, um, up into the northwest and the Chinese into Gandhara and the Chinese pilgrims saw that and venerated that, that uh, bowl. Um, you also get the idea that the Buddha's ideas, his teaching, his dharma is 
the presence of the Buddha and the Buddha himself said this, um, you know, if you want to see me, you see the Dharma. If you want to see the Dharma, you see me. And there is also a practice of depositing short sayings or other even, as we will see, larger collection of manuscripts in stupas or in images to, again, to bring power to uh, sanctify that object or space or place. Um, now, this region of Gandhara, you know, as I said, has a long history of Buddhism and the artwork is particularly characteristic. So being at the crossroads, it was under many different influences. The image on the right, you can see um, this image, Gandhara, sort of second century. Um, it has Greek features, namely in the robe and in the contra posture, this posture here, and the hairstyle and various other features. And if you compare it with, and slightly later, but it's representative of, of Mathura, which was also within the Kushan Empire, but a different cultural region south of Delhi. You see how different the style is, not just the medium, but the, the, the way. So, you know, Greek influence on the artwork was quite profound. You get images like this from Hada stucco work. Um, um, Hariti, who was a demoness in Rajgir, who was converted, um, tamed by the Buddha. Here she is in Gandhara, depicted in the form of the, the you know, Greek type and Roman fortuna with her cornucopia. Right? Um, similarly, you know, Vajrapani, the, the, the one who has a Vajra, a lightning bolt in his pani, in his hand, who was the guardian protector of the Buddha, is depicted in the form of Heracles in Gandhara, um, as in this piece on the right. Um, then we find, you know, just decoration in Buddhist monasteries, a straight out Mediterranean Greek, you know, um, elements, um, but not completely, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an art form that takes on many different influences. This this beautiful image from the Hall Museum of the Buddha while he was in, you know, engaged in you know, his extreme ascetic practice, you know, depicts this fire altar, which some would say actually is Iranian influence. Or you know, this piece here, um, this character here, who was clearly the patron of this piece, having it carved, is uh, dressed in Kushan. The Kushans were Central Asian horsemen who invaded North India. So he's depicted in, in, in this area. So we have this, you know, extremely rich artistic tradition. Now, the very, with, with, which incorporates elements from different uh, cultures, uh, uh, cultural spheres, and produces something unique and new. Um, and, you know, also Gandhara is quite significant for the shift from the, what's called the aniconic representation of the Buddha. So in the early period, the Buddha was, represented by, by means of symbols. So, you know, as in this stupa here, third to fourth, first century BC, this is the, the, depict, the Buddha is depicted by his seat and this tree, right? So you don't depict in the early period the Buddha in iconic form. But we find in Gandhara a shift from the an iconic to the iconic, representing the Buddha in human form, as you find here, um, along probably simultaneous with Matara, this other site further south. And here is a story in which, you know, when the Buddha goes up to preach to his mother and um, the gods, the Abhidharma, the scholastic you know, treatises of, of, of Buddhism, um, King Udayana of Kausambi misses him so much as an image of the Buddha uh, made. He presented to the Buddha when the Buddha returns to earth and the Buddha um, validates it. And this is, if you like, the foundation story for why it's acceptable to depict the Buddha in human form. But what that did is it suddenly freed artists up to depict many more um, episodes from the Buddha's life. So you get this incredible flourishing of imagery and artistic representation in the region. Um, you know, make very important, you know, cult images such as this one, which would have been placed around the monastery, particularly around the stupa. But what is Gandhara is really, you know, rich in it is its narrative imagery. So, you know, whereas say, um, uh, you know, in India proper for the South, you'll get, I think the number is about 30 episodes of the Buddha's life represented in Gandhara we have at least 100 episodes of the Buddhist life represented. The, the, the Gandharans were very interested in the biography, as we will see in the literature. It you know, begins with the major events, such as 
the conception of the Buddha, of the body Buddha to be, the Bodhisattva, his birth, um, his awakening or enlightenment, you know, his first preaching, um, and then his death, the, the major events. But then the Gandharans, you know, also were interested in these past lives, Jatakas, um, beginning with the Dipankara Jataka particularly, and then, you know, minor what we would consider to be apparently minor episodes such as, you know, the Bodhisattva, the Buddha-to-be goes off to school, as in this one, or the marriage of Siddhartha, the, the Bodhisattva, to his Yasodhara, right? Um, now, in terms of placing where this art was, you know, was placed, many different places, particularly within the monastic, mostly within the monastic complex around the stupa, as you circumambulated it, keeping it on your right, you would read off the images or have the images read off for you by your, you know, attendant, your, your village monk and engage with that. And often within the stupa would be the actual physical relics of the Buddha or of a saint and so on. Um, now painting, so that's sort of sculpture, which was really the most richly represented from this region. But, you know, painting is represented, but it didn't really survive very well. Um, doesn't help by the title I'm um, blowing up the the the, um, the Buddhas in Bamiyan. Um, but we do get in this, you know, Gandhara had a huge influence artistically and, and elsewhere. We know that, you know, it was through this region that Buddhism spread up into even Eastern Iran, but particularly Central Asia and then onto China, Japan and so on. And these, many of these regions were heavily influenced by trends, artistic and so on in Gandhara, intellectual, you know, they, many of the texts came from that region. Um, you know, you look at this stupa in the Southern Silk Route in Miran, was excavated by the British archaeologist Errol Stein, and you have this, you know, great gallery of artwork. And this is considered to be, by some, to be the largest gallery of Gandharan artwork, even though it's not in Gandhara, but it survived because of the dry environment. So very rich sort of there is clearly a painting tradition of Gandhara. It's represented here in Central Asia, but it didn't survive so well in Gandhara. Now, the region, as I said, it was, you know, a holy land made so by relics and, and stories and so on. The Buddha coming to that region. Chinese pilgrims, you know, sort of fifth century onwards, beginning with Fa Xian, I think there were early ones as well, travelled through this area. Some just come into that region to visit the sites, to study and so on, collect manuscripts, others passing through on their way through. You know, one of the most famous, Xuanzang, 7th century, um, you know, his journey, fantastical journeys, you know, beginning on, uh, in Chang'an, you know, travelling. This is all by foot through deserts, across these extraordinary mountains, through, you know, visiting the holy sites of India down here, studying, collecting manuscripts and bringing them back to, to China. Some of the most extraordinary journeys in history, I think. Um, but passing through this land, it wasn't just because it was the, the way you could walk, but it was also, it was visiting the holy sites in this region. Now, um, writing in this region begins with Ashoka, as I said, who left inscriptions, had um, inscriptions um, translated into the local language of Gandhari. So the beginning in the third century BC, the language is Gandhari. It's related to Sanskrit and Pali and these other, um, you know, ancient Indian languages. And the script is Kharoshti. So the script was derived from Aramaic script, a, a, sort of a, a vestige of the Persian Empire. And it goes from right to left, whereas all other Indian scripts are based on the Brahmi script, which goes from left to right. Right now, you know, again, a little bit like the artistic tradition, um, writing has many advantages. It can facilitate the transmission of text, but also the writing and composition of texts. Um, now, the language itself, you know, I won't go into details. It's philological, but it's very related. This is Gandhari, Pali, Sanskrit, very related. Um, problem with Gandhari is the spelling was never standardized, right? And so you can have the same word spelt multiple different times, like the word dharma, or look at these reflexes of this simple word and, right? Um, words can contract, you know, syllables omitted, and then sort of these are inflected languages, you know, whereas in Sanskrit it's very clear what is the subject, object, and say the location. Um, in Gandhari, you can't tell that because the endings have all weakened and they could be represented by any vowel. 
Similarly, you know, this script doesn't mark long vowels. So what in, you know, Sanskrit could be the word bala strength or bala child in, in Gandhari is written exactly the same way. Same with kama could be Sanskrit karma, desire, or kama pali karma, karman action in Sanskrit. So, you know, adds to the fun of trying to read this material. Now, this language and script, apart from being used in Gand ancient Gandhara, was also used in periods in northern Bactria and then on the Silk Route in the north and the south, so quite important. Um, we knew it about it uh, first through inscriptions, as we saw, and then but the bilingual coins or coins of, of the various kings. So the, the Greeks issued bilingual coins, Greek on one side, you know, um, Gandhari Kroshti on the other side. Um, the, the first literary document was found actually not in Gandhara, but on the southern Silk Route in Khotan. This is the famous Khotan Dhammapada or Gandhari Dhammapada, and it remained the only Buddhist literary document for about 100 years until the collections that I will talk about. Um, so this is a little bit, you know, this was produced by Andrew Glass, one member of our team, um, this, in the writing of the script. The material of these manuscripts I'm going to talk about is birch bark. The ink is a carbon-based ink. And this is the sort of stylus you're looking at. Um, it's basically a reed um, pen. These are examples of, of ink pots from Taxila Museum in Pakistan. Um, you know, it gives you a sense of the, the, the technology behind the production of manuscripts and writing. Um, as I said, um, you know, there is this was major trade routes coming up through here into Central Asia, um, China, and so on and you know, capillaries of trade routes, right? This is the sort of country you're passing through by which Buddhism spread to China, the Chinese pilgrims are passing through, traders and so on. Leaves behind, you know, um, petroglyphs like this with, with Buddhist imagery, multiple languages, including Gandhari, Sanskrit, Tibetan and so on, right? Then also, as I said, on the, the Southern Silk Route, you have sites like this where Gandhari language was, um, used. So these people were actually um, Iranian, not Gandhara nor Indian, but they used Gandhari and Kuroshti in their, their secular documents, letters to the king, by the king, and so on, right? Um, so I can just. Okay. You can see that okay still? Yes. Okay, great. So as I said, the first literary document, first manuscript was this one, remained so for 100 years, found in the 19th century, not in Gandhara Khotan. So this, based on this, scholars surmise that there must have been, you know, a large Buddhist literature in Gandhara. Well, this is, you know, fairly obvious. Um, <clears throat> but there was no evidence for it. This was it. Now, you know, um, the first collection you know, in the last 30 years, several major collections have appeared, um, mostly outside of Pakistan. Um, the British Library, Gandhari Collection was the first to appear. These manuscripts here, birch bark, were found in this pot and they were donated to the British Library. This is what you're looking at, they're scroll formats, um, birch bark, as I said. Um, they were conserved at the British Library <clears throat> by a skilled team of conservators. Um, you know, the uh, overview of this was published by Richard Solomon. The collection is headed by, the, the project was headed by him. A major component of that is being undertaken by Stefan Baums at the University of Munich in Germany. Um, you know, Richard was published the first text. So, you know, this is a very old Buddhist text in sort of terms of chronology, um, the Rhinoceros Sutra, which espouses the ideal of, of um, you know, being self-sufficient, living alone if you can't find friends, of living a, you know, a life of detachment and so on. So very important text. And the this collection, this British Library collection, based on the inscription on the pot and some of the evidence from the text themselves, which have, you know, here we have a Gandhari version, a version in Pali and Chinese and so on, or many of these texts do. Um, it tells us that this was created by, um, a school of Buddhism called the Dhamma Guptakas. Now, this school doesn't flourish anymore. Many of the early Buddhist schools disappeared. 
predominantly with the Theravada representative of that, that lineage surviving in Sri Lanka, Burma, Thailand. Um, so very important witnesses to the literature of a particular school that we didn't know about before, um, apart from telling us a lot about the sort of history development of these texts. Um, I published the second one, which was a collection of so short discourses or, or sutras of the Buddha. Um, Colette Cox, again, University of Washington, working on um, texts without parallels. So Richard and I published texts that have parallels, so it was much easier to work with this difficult material if you've got Pali, Sanskrit, or Chinese version. She's working with these Abhidharma sort of scholastic treatises. Um, you know, interesting, they represent, you know, give us an idea of the ideas that were being debated among Buddhist communities or important to them, such as, you know, this is a criticism by this Dharmaguptaka school of views held by the, the what we would refer to as the Mula Savastivadans or Savastivadans, um, just one example. Um, the second collection turned up called the Robert Heaney Collection. It's on loan to the University of Washington. Um, this is, a again, was found in a pot. Um, it has an inscription written on the pot and the lid, which states that it was um, commissioned by one Rohana, presumably a layman, um, in honour of his mother and father and all beings, and that it was interred in a stupa, right? So he looks like Rohana commissioned the writing of this sort of more or less an anthology of basically discourses, sutras and biographies of the Buddha to be interred in a stupa as a meritorious act. You know, as I said, Stupa worship central to or, or veneration not worship veneration in which the sutra is a central place which a focus point of one's um, uh, focus um, of one's activity um, very important in Buddhism. So the senior manuscripts again you know basically look like old cigars so sort of, you know two thousand odd year old birch bark. This collection dates to the sort of. 130, 140, based on carbon dating we had done in Australia. The British Library collection, sorry, I forgot to mention, is dated by Richard Solomon to the first century of the Common Era. So these manuscripts represent the earliest, not only Indian, but also Buddhist manuscripts we have by many, many centuries. They they're, they're really take us way back to, you know, some centuries after the Buddha himself, which is so far how, as close as we can get in terms of sort of material evidence. Um, a good example from this collection is this um, manuscript. This is the colour images. This is my reconstruction of it based on um, infrared images. Um, on one side, say, it has the story of Tapusra and Balika, the merchants who give the Buddha his first meal after he is awakened, and the gods of the four directions, the Lokapala, giving the Buddha his a bowl, which he collapses into one. You know, we have versions of this in many different languages and belonging to different schools, which is interesting, which we can compare, which gives us an idea of the, <clears throat> the, tra the trajectory, the development of this literature. And then we also see, as you saw images before, this event is depicted in art. It was clearly an important event, um, according to the Buddhists. You know, the bowl, as I said, was venerated, so you often get um, images at the base of, of um uh, of the bowl at the base of, uh, of um, a sculpture. Um, another example of a text in this collection is the second discourse of the Buddha, the, what's um, called the discourse on the not self characteristic, right? So, in this important discourse, the Buddha outlines, you know, that basically if you start analyzing how we are, what it, that the things by which, the means by which we are in the world, namely body, feelings, perceptions, volitional actions, and consciousness, you know, you can't find anything within that is, that is permanent, right? Everything's impermanent and that, that um, therefore you can't regard it to yourself. And there's an argument for why that's the case. And his, you know, conclusion is that, that you know, the one who sees in this way, who is a well-taught noble disciple is dispassionate towards these things. In other words, don't identify with these things as oneself. They'll only bring you suffering and so on. And as a result, the minds of these monks are, are, li are liberated. In other words, they become parahats. Um, another major collection is uh, was found in Bamiyan. These were said to have been found in these caves when you know, um, people sheltering 
uh, either broke down a wall or a wall fell down. This interesting collection spans some 800 years, beginning with the very earliest, where we have gun manuscripts in Gandhari language and Khrushchev script, such as this discourse, which describes the last months of the Buddha's life, his cremation and so on. Um, and then the later manuscripts are actually in not in Gandhari language, but Sanskrit language and in the Brahmi script. So these witness the shift among Buddhist communities in this region from the use of the Gandhari language in Khrushchev script to the Sanskrit language and the Brahmi script. Many important, great diversity of genres and types of texts within this collection being edited and, and worked on by an international group of, of scholars. Um, another important collection was found in 1999 um, in this time in Pakistan, in Bajau region. Um, it's currently in Peshwa um, and it's a project headed by Ingo Strauch at the University of Lausanne. Um, great diversity of manuscripts, texts, among them, you know, important Mahayana texts, such as the uh, text that resembles the Akshobhya Vyuha, right? So, um, you know, here we have a description at this time, the people who assume the 10 virtues and of these people will be unlimited. Their life, presumably, all sickness will be finished. At that time, houses will be made of seven kinds of jewels and so on and so on. It goes on. So this is a witness, a proto Akshobhya Vyuha Sutra, or at least in that lineage, tells us a lot about the, the appearance of Gandharan, um, in Gandhara particularly, but in India more generally, about of Mahayana and the Mahayana literature um, and so on. Um, this has just been published by Andreas Sos as part of that, um, that project. This is an early, uh, three early Mahayana treatises from Gandhara. So, you know, what are we seeing? We see this is what we sort of knew a little bit from, you know, say Chinese accounts and so on, that Gandhara was an important region for uh, um, the development of ideas, et cetera, um, literature. So these, these are texts that are without parallel, although maybe the genre and so on might be known. Um, another collection, the split collection headed by Harry Falk, some of the very earliest texts, Dhammapada, and some rather late texts. So, you know, early witness, the earliest witness actually to this perfection of wisdom genre. Um, very important, so these are some of the earliest Mahayana texts are extremely important, again, for understanding the development of Mahayana literature. Um, individual texts, such as the Library of Congress has a scroll. Um, and then there's, you know, texts, I've been talking so far mostly about tech manuscripts in the Gandhari language, Khrushchev script. This collection, it's in private collection in, in America, is headed by Uwe Hartmann, University of uh, Munich. And these are Sanskrit and Brahmi um, manuscripts. This very important manuscript, um, which he and his team, students are editing. This is the Long Discourses, it's part of the, the early Buddhist canon. Um, so a very important witness to, again, this belongs to the Mula Savastivadan school. Um, and, uh, you know, was only witnessed through fragments in the past. Um, then we also have Buddhist manuscripts in the Bactrian language. Well, the Bactrians, it's Iranian language, but they use the Greek script. So, you know, Again, now there's a new collection that, that we're working on, Richard Sol and myself, Paul Harris and others, um, which uh, is apparently one of the biggest so far. And um, this, the first to be published, was published by Paul um, Harrison, Tim Lentz and Richard Solomon. And this is, you know, a fragment of the Pratyupana Samadhi Sutra. I won't describe the full title, but extremely important because this was witnessed previously only in Chinese translations much, much later or through some later Sanskrit fragments from Central Asia. So here you have the oldest Indic witness to this text, which, you know, this sort of raises ideas of, well, um, you know, was in fact Mahayana, did it originate in Gandhara or was it a major centre of Mahayana? Were this text written in Gandhara because this is the Gandhari language? Um, and, you know, and so on. So many raises many important issues. Same, I published this, which was, looks very fragmentary, but it's very important. It was um, the first monastic ledger. A ledger describes what gifts were given to this Buddhist monastery. And the donor turns out to be one of the very important Kushan king, Vimakad Faisis, who was uh, not known to be a patron of Buddhism in the past. So historically, very important sort of documents. 
Richard Solomon's working on this, which is a biography of the Buddha um, of an, you know, without a parallel. So, you know, it sort of fits in with, you know, the Gandharan interest in the biography of the Buddha as witnessed in artwork. Here, manuscripts of versions of the biography of the Buddha that don't have uh, parallels. Similarly, this one, you know, the earliest Indica to station of a very important Mahayana text, Samadhi Raja Sutra, which again was only witnessed in, you know, fifth century Chinese translations and, and much, much later Sanskrit versions. Um, you know, in 2014, Stefan Baum's calculated the number of, you know, birch bark manuscripts, um, distinct texts, you know, 115 and so on. Well, that was 2014. There's now many, many more. So we're really looking at a very big corpus of of Gandharan text preserved in the Gandhari language to say nothing of the, the Sanskrit ones from this region and um, in multiple you know, genres. So you know, what do we have? Immensely important for the history of the region, uh, of Buddhism in the region particularly, the schools that flourish there, development of Buddhist thought and practice, the nature of the text used you know, by Buddhist communities, um, the development of Buddhist literature and canons, spread of Buddhism from South Asia, India, up into Central Asia, um, understanding of South Indian Buddhism more, more generally. And then the Chinese translations, which were made often from China, Gandhari versions, and then, you know, art historical research. Um, <clears throat> so we have, you know, what we have basically is, you know, a vast, um, you know, collections, and most of it remains unpublished. We're, we're publishing as fast as we can. There's only about actually less than 20 scholars worldwide who actually are actively publishing this material. So, you know, you, I showed you a book I produced on the, the British Library Collection. It took me four years to, to do that, so it takes a long time. Now, you know, the digital age has brought in tools that will facilitate um, uh, publication of this material in new ways and sometimes in more timely fashion. So a group of us internationally have developed something called READ, which is a platform <clears throat> for publishing these materials and studying them. We have an instantiation of that at the University of, of Sydney. Um, so I just want to stop this and go to our website. So the first, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, digital resource developed for Gandharan Buddhist studies was the Gandharan Dictionary by Andrew Glass and Stephen Baums. Um, fantastic resource, primarily for scholars, dictionary, bibliography, um, catalog, and so on, right? Um, so we at the University of Sydney, now that's a specialist tool. We're interested, uh, it's not just Sydney, sorry, it's, a, it's an international group. Uh, we're, you know, interested in expanding that to to make that material um, available in dynamic ways and ways to community, available to communities, particularly in Pakistan, um, in ways in which we haven't um, had available before. So this is our website. Um, <clears throat> so we have different collections developing. Um, the Robert Senior Collection, which I profiled. Um, this is a new, new feature we've developed recently, which is, uh, faceted search facility. So I can say within this collection of 41 texts, how many have Sanskrit parallels, right? Or how many have Chinese parallels and, and find them. Or show me all the examples with parallels in a long discourse collection and so on. Um, we launched a journal called the um, Journal of Gandharan Buddhist Texts. And this is, um, <clears throat> you know, fully digital dynamic um, Journal. So this is an article that was published by Joe Marino, University of Washington. Um, so what you have is here, say, um, so we have, as I click a word in the edition, right, not a, first of all, the grammatical status of that. What is the Pali equivalent? What's the, the Sanskrit equivalent? What is the grammatical status of it? What is the translation? And the actual letters or akshras and <clears throat> Uh, highlighted, right? So this is a fantastic tool for learning Gandhari and for scholars to go word by word and analyzing what the, the text is. Um, I'm also, you know, within this facility, you have uh, a glossary that is, you know, each, you know, word within this, um, <clears throat> this text. 
um, is, you know, I can see, give me all the examples of the word this, right? Um, similarly, you know, the translation. Um, so these are analytical tools, ability to engage with it, you know, with this text. Um, and then say a paleographical script report. So, you know, I want to see, well, what is the shape of, um, say, the letter ga in this text? And, you know, I can, these are all the instances of ga in this text, et cetera. An ability then to, you know, export this material in um, <clears throat> in TEI and HTML and, and so on. Um, this is a collection that's been worked on. These are reliquaries by Ian McCrabb, University of Sydney. Um, so this is, uh, so Ian McCrabb is really, he was a student of mine, um, has 30 years of, of um, experience in the, um, as an I, heading an IT consulting company, all of these digital developments, very, he's a central player in that. Um, but here you have an, ins an inscription, right? So the same feature as we saw before, as you, you know, select a word, it will give you the grammatical status and center. But this is fairly new and we're working on this with, you know, our colleague um, Murtaza Taj at the uh, Lahore University of Mechanical Sciences in, in Lahore. Um, this is the 3D capacity, right? So here you have this ability of, you know, as I select a word, it will rotate and then, or I can do it also by selecting a word like that. So it's a, yet another tool for studying particularly three-dimensional material. Um, now, one of the problems with this material is it's, you know, a lot of the publications are, very, are scholarly or for elite audiences or are in the English language and not really available to the general public. So, you know, what I think is important is to provide context contextual information to these collections. So maybe you're all familiar with something called Story Maps, which is, um, you know, a way by which you can, you know, present aspects of, you know, a subject, a topic, you know, within sort of a, an interesting uh, form that the, um, you know, is more accessible to a wider public, right? Um, so this story map of which within it, I won't show you, we don't have time, you can also then access the editions and translations and so on. Um, now, one of the things we're also working at the moment is applying that, that intimate connection between the letters and the text of the um, what we call aggregates, scholarly aggregates. So this is centered on artwork. So, you know, this is the year five Buddha University of, sorry, not university, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in, in, um, <clears throat> in New York. They produce 3D images. I'll show you in a minute of this. So, you know, I can, this will bring up, you know, notes on, well, what is this? Well, it's a robe. What is, who is this, right? Um, oh, that's sorry, that's wrong one. Who is this? It's a bodhisattva. And then we can have scholarly notes. Um, you know, this is an Oshnisha. This is this and so on. And so we go through, right? Um, similarly, an article on, as you saw before, on the inscription of, that is at the base of this. And then, you know, 3D image of this, right, which is, you know, this was produced by the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, you know, it's a fantastic resource, resource for scholars because a lot of images are only known in books and so on, you know, we can, you know, the details, extraordinary, you know, what you can see and then also you can explore this piece through that, um, that annotation. Um, Uh, sorry. Um, so uh, this is exploring. This is really a work in progress. Um, actually, sorry, the words. This is again. This is a, you know this being led by um, Mike Skinner, um, which is uh, that is giving contextual information to that, almost like a uh, a um, uh, encyclopedia article, and similarly applying this. Um, uh, this feature of a catalog, right, where you can bring up dimensions of that. So again, this is fantastic pedagogical tool. So how can you um, uh, understand, better understand, explore this piece? And of course, this can be hosted by, say, museums in Pakistan 
and elsewhere, right? They can tap into this, it's open source, or will be, it's not at the moment, still in, in being explored. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, just a bit slow in loading. So finally, just to, before I conclude, <clears throat> digital rep repatriation, what is that? Well, you know, what we have is, um, you know, currently there is very little information available. Let me just make that bigger, actually, available to the communities from which this material comes. You know, a lot of this material, whether it's through the colonial period, you know, material being taken out of the, Afghanistan, Pakistan, or, um, you know, during the more modern periods as part of the antiquities trade, local communities aren't fully engaged with this material. They don't know much about their Buddhist heritage. So what we are developing is this sort of, you know, Buddhist, this uh, digital, sorry, digital repatriation strategy, which through the sort of technologies that I've been showing you, we are able to um, make this material available in interesting dynamic ways to those host communities and then to larger communities, whether it's in whatever country you like. And, you know, central to that will also be, you know, tr translating this material into local languages, whether it's Urdu, Pashto or Dari, um, so that local communities can really, you know, find out more about that. Now, even in Pakistan, for example, if you go to these major museums in Pakistan, beautiful collections of Gandharan art, but there's often very little contextual information. I think that a, you know, a Pakistani person going to these museums would not have a very clear idea of Buddhism, the cultural context to that. And we see this, this strategy, which you know, I'm only hinting at here as a, as a, a move in the direction of you know, making material that is sort of not generally available, it's only found in scholarly publications or, you know, is outside the country available to, you know, communities from which this material came or, and then larger communities around the world. Um, so, and that's primarily in the form of editions, translation, analysis of, of texts and so on. Um, so I think that's um, about all. So what do we have? We have basically, um, you know, really an ever-growing corpus of fantastic textual material from this region, what is ancient Gandhara, Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, only a few scholars that are working on it, um, making it available to scholarly communities and wider communities as, as quickly as pos possible. Um, now, as you see, through digital means, but, you know, this is, you know, really important, fundamental to, you know, thread shedding light on very early phase in Buddhism, and actually over a long period of time from now first century BC to sort of the eighth century of the common era in different languages, you know, throwing light on, um, you know, development of, say, the Mahayana, where did it arise, what was its first literature, etc. Um, what were the practices? What sort of texts were these communities reading in the, in the Northwest? It was, after all, the region from which Buddhism spread to Central Asia and China. So very important to understanding then Central Asian Buddhism, Chinese Buddhism, and even what remains of Iranian Buddhism. And for developments, you know, you know in a greater context, artistic developments, um, you know, this artwork, I didn't really go into it, but these manuscripts do have a bearing on the artwork before because they provide for the first time textual um, forms of the stories that were represented in art form. Um, so I think I've said enough and that's about time. So I'll, I'll stop sharing. Um, is that okay, Trent? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Allen. That was such a fantastic and engaging lecture. Not only did you provide this whirlwind, uh, kind of whirlwind, fast pace, but also richly detailed contextual overview of this region, how uh, Buddhism came to be important in that region and the, the texts that are found, but also these kinds of new technological platforms that uh, make the work uh, much more 
accessible both for scholars and for the public at large. So thank you very much for that. In many ways, it felt like this kind of uh, story map uh, that you briefly showed us uh, brought to life in, in lecture form. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, so have, I hope I didn't speak too fast. Um, I do talk like that, but it also, there's, you know, as you say, it's an immensely rich area. Um, so lots to talk about. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm, I'm sure in the, the questions that are beginning to come in now that we'll be able to touch on some of those areas that you mentioned a little bit more deeply. So while we're waiting for questions to come in, and this is the time for those of you here in the audience to type a chat message to KF Q&A, and then I'll be able to relay selected messages to, to Dr. Allen here, and we can bring your questions into the conversation. So while we're waiting for some more questions to come in, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about what it was like first to learn to read this material in Gandhari, and what was what about your, your previous background in studying the stylistic characteristics of uh, Pali Buddhist texts yes. was helpful as you moved into studying material in Gandhari? Yes. So I um, first, I actually studied Gandhari as an undergraduate, surprisingly. This was before, way back in ancient history um, under Louise Herkes, who was a linguist. She worked on Prakrit languages at the Australian National University in Australia. The only documents available then were inscriptions and the Central Asian um, secular letters and so on. Mm -hmm. So I had no idea that one day I would, you know, work on this material. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I did my doctorate at Cambridge and uh, Professor Norman, we actually read the Kotandama part of the only literary document at that time. So I did study a little bit and then these manuscripts started appearing up, appearing the British Library Collection, Richard Solomon, um, headed that project. I wrote to him, told him what my skills were, and he invited me there. So that was sort of the beginning of it, um, working on this material. In terms of my, you know, my study of, you know, Pali texts is not because the Pali are the most ancient and authentic or anything. It's just because they are, you know, representative of that early phase of Buddhist literature, and they're it's an entire corpus, a canon, and it's been transmitted for all these centuries. So it's a a very good first port of call to look at in detail at the fabric of Buddhist texts. How were they put together? And we must understand that, you know, during the Buddhist period and then for some hundreds of years after, ancient India was an oral tradition. So, you know, it's very alien to us. We're, we're literate, you know, we've been literate for many centuries. How, how do you compose sort of texts we are reading in an oral setting? right, without writing. And so I looked at those features. So when I first started working on these Kandara materials, I was, um, because of my expertise in that area, I worked mostly on the discourses on the sutras. So my study, that really detailed study of Pali material really helped me better understand and place the Gandhari material. And that sort of, that many years working on that type of material then resulted in that, that recent book, which was an attempt to understand how did how were those or initially oral texts then transmitted over long periods of time and were Buddhist communities willing to change the wording, you know, even that attributed to the Buddha and so on. So it was, yep. Thank you so much. Sort of another dimension of what sort of made it possible to be able to study these uh, Gantari materials was the kinds of technologies applied in their conservation and also at the the level of of conservators to be able to re remove manuscripts and unfold them very carefully yes. so we have one yep. one question that's come in uh, about like how the manuscripts were removed from the pots what you know happened to the pots after that or other yes. cases in which it was very might be very difficult to uh, un uh, to make a manuscript available to yep. study, if you could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, well, unfortunately, a lot of this material comes from clandestine archaeological digs. So the British Library material, you saw an image of the manuscripts in a pot. They actually turned up at the British Library with the, just the pots, there were several of them, and the manus individual manuscripts had been taken out and put in Indian pickle jars, clean but still pickle jars, and then transported there. Now... This results in damage. It also results in loss of contextual information, what texts were layered and so on. Um, now, you know, that's unfortunate. That's just 
how it happened. It was not in our control. Um, but then the British Library have skilled conservators. Basically, this is birch bark's 2,000 odd years old. It's extremely bit brittle. If you touch it wrongly, it'll just shatter, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is to handle it very carefully and it's conserved. You, you start to act their, their roles. So mm -hmm. you expose them to humidity over, say, a three day mm -hmm. period. And the, the very ancient bark starts absorbing the humidity. Now, when bark is fresh, it's very pliable. You can bend it, fold it, and do all sorts, right? Mm -hmm. So you're restoring some of the humidity, which allows you to, mm -hmm. but as you saw, most of it's fragmentary, and that's because mm -hmm. you cannot restore the full plasticity. It still just cracks and breaks as, mm -hmm. as you unfold it. Um, and then it's conserved between glass, certain type of neutral glass, and, um, you know, special housings built for them and so on. So then we embark on imaging, photographing with colour and then infrared, which is very important. And it's a combination of reading the colour images and the infrared that we can really get the best reading because they both reveal different dimensions of the text. Fantastic. Thank you. And we have a number of other questions coming in that are sort of related to, to this as well. So. Uh, one that I uh, I think we even received before this this lecture uh, began, and I, th I thought it was framed in quite an interesting and provocative way, and that is, was Gandhara more Buddhist than the rest of greater India of its day, or was it simply drier that allowed for the climate to... Uh, yes, to I think, I think the latter. I mean, the thing is, of course, the huge, the richness, as I just tried to sort of illustrate today, the richness of the Buddhist heritage of that region, um, it is, you know, fantastic. It's preserved and now with the manuscripts. In the case of manuscripts, it's really the dryness. The same with very big collections were found in Central Asia at the beginning of the 20th century by the Germans and English and, and others. Um, so what you are actually seeing is it's not, I think, it was a particularly rich and thriving community for many centuries, but probably no more so than you know, further down the Gangetic Plains, the major centres and so on, or, you know, parts of South India, Andhra Pradesh and elsewhere um, that we know from other sources. It's just that it hasn't survived. Um, and so we have to be careful that that what we get from Gandhara is not skewing our understanding. Like, so say, for example, these are the earliest manuscripts of Mahayana texts, right? And there's always been this debate, did the Mahayana arise in Gandhara or was it in Andhra Pradesh or somewhere else, right? And, you know, because of this, you might be lent, inclined to think, well, this is proof that Gandhara was the origin of Mahayana. It's just, you can't use it like that. Just the evidence hasn't survived elsewhere. Thank you. And speaking of this, the kind of the historical question of how act old the, the, the particular manuscripts are and what does it tell us about some of the early history? I have a couple of related questions here. One is from my co-host here of the Goodman Lectures at Kensi Foundation, uh, Dr. Minyuan Gao, who asks, when is the earliest extant Gandhari manuscript dated uh, to? And we have one more, uh, well, let me uh, ask that question first, then we have a related question okay, from Ayush Gupta. So, um, the earliest we have, we think, you know, securely is the first century BC, right? and quite a few of them are turning up that. Now, several manuscript collections or, or examples from them have been carbon dated. Um, I've done some in Australia, some in New Zealand, and, and uh, Harry Falk dated some of the split collection. Now, he got dates with one of them, one of those manuscripts of the second century BC, and he doubted that. Now, we just don't know. Now, the evidence for when Buddhists you started using writing, um, it comes now from these manuscripts. And before that, the earliest attestation was the account that in Sri Lanka, um, the, the canon and its commentaries were written down for the first time in the first century BC. So it looks like the first century. Now, writing as a technology was known from in India from a, you know, Ashoka, third century BC at least. And, you know, the Greeks and the, the Persians had writing before that as a model. But it appears that probably first century BC, perhaps second, but we don't have really secure evidence, is where the first manuscripts start to appear. 
And then this is uh, Ayush Gupta's question. It, can we say anything, therefore, about um, both in terms of the, the the sculpture and the manuscript traditions? How do they um, sit historically in terms of other places in, in greater India? Or you mentioned that, of course, the Mathura um, tradition of I iconic representations of the Buddha seems to come about at the same time. Yes. Um, and is that also... Um, it would have been true that there would have been traditions of making, um, writing down Buddhist texts prior to those that were written down in Kuntara as well. It's just that these are the ones that have yes. survived. Yeah. So as I said, the, the manus these manuscripts witnessed in Gandhara, the first material evidence, although writing, we have writing there with Ashoka's inscriptions in a very, in the same language. Um, and then in Sri Lanka at the same time. Now, you know, it would only really be either through external account or through a manuscript dated too earlier that would push that date back. Um, you know, as I said, as Buddhism was an early, it was initially oral, so it had a sophisticated means of preserving these texts. Um, but writing has many advantages, but writing never would have replaced the oral and the memorization. India remained for many, many centuries, and the Buddhists up to this day, you know, monastics learn texts by heart, um, it's a way, you know, saves you having to carry around a manuscript or a book for a start, but, you know, you have something internalised, you can draw on it to think and contemplate something. Um, and manuscript would have always been expensive anyway, at least in the early period. So it remained an, an, an oral tradition. Um, in terms of writing a manuscript, well, we just don't have manuscripts from up elsewhere from that early period. Um, doesn't mean they weren't used, just the, the, the main... Indian climate is too hostile to conservation of manuscripts. Thank you. So I want to turn to some other questions. We're getting a lot of fantastic questions coming in from the audience. So thank you all for, for raising these questions. And I hope we'll be able to get to many of them. Uh, one is from Professor Jiang Wu, who's a uh, fantastic scholar of the formation of Buddhist uh, canons in East Asia, among other subjects. Um, who writes, thank you for the wonderful informative lecture. You mentioned uh, Buddhist canon in passing. Do we have a new discovery of a prototype canon, a list of books, for example? Uh, Solomon published a paper a long time ago suggesting there is no definite evidence, any new progress uh, recently. I, I just separately recall that you mentioned something in one of your uh, writings around a certain list of texts that appears in one of the senior collection yes. scrolls, but it, there may be yep. other kinds of things you could bring to light on this question. Yep. So, um, you know, of course, being scholars, being scholars, there's, you know, hot debate on what, what do they mean? What do these texts mean? How do you understand them? How do you interpret them? So, for example, um, Richard Solomon would argue, and many others as well, that what we're looking at, the period of these earliest manuscripts, second, first century BC to second, third century, this is, you know, that it's likely that you still had a flexible canon, right? So in the early Buddhist community, it's likely that you had, you know, canon, what does it mean? It's a collection of authoritative texts, right? And that in time, that becomes fixed. So when did take these, these lists become fixed? We don't know exactly. Um, so some would argue that the Skandaran material is witness to that, you know, pre-fixed canon status. So, but nonetheless, they certainly witness the existence of texts that now form a part of fixed canons or even more flexible canons. So, for example, Richard and others have worked on a... Um, uh, fragments from Bamiyan of the what's called the Echo Trikagama, the, the collection, the section of the canon, which is arranged, has short sutras ranged on a numerical basis. And this, and then say the Sini collection, which is mostly sutras or discourses from the connected collection, the Samyukta Agama, Samyutta Nikaya. To my mind, these witness the fact that you had a stable at least books within and ranged in such a way, right? Um, now, how how flexible they were, whether the material is still being added. We know that Buddhist communities over time were often willing to rearrange their canons and you know transmit move material from one to another, re rearrange internally, even some details of the wording. So this is an open question, but um, 
probably also find, for example, say there is um, the text that uh, you saw the first book published by Richard Solomon on the Rhinoceros Sutra. This now you will find in Pali tradition as part of a canonical text called the Sutta Nipata. Or in this new collection, there are fragments in the split collection of what's called the Atakavaga, the Book of Eights, um, which is some of the oldest strata of the Buddhist literature it's thought, it's, it's verse. Um, and um, this is just a manuscript contains that. So you could use that as a basis for arguing that these sort of sections or books, some books, some sections were transmitted independently and then finally brought together in bigger collections. Now, we know that process, that's what happened. Now, when you actually form them into more fixed collections, it's an open question. Some would argue that these manuscripts prove that they were still in the independent, you know, books stage. I don't think that's necessarily the case. You know, you, you might have just wanted a copy of one particular section that was already, had people had an idea formed part of this collection based on other reasons. So it's an open question and just being discussed. On a related note, we have a question coming in from Atul uh, Bhattarai, who asks, in comparing some of these texts with their Pali and Chinese Agma parallels, what are some of the conclusions we might be able to come to about early Buddhist uh, doctrine? And I, just to come back to your presentation, you yeah. gave us a little snapshot of this Anattvalakshana, this, this Gandhari form of what's known as the Anattvalakshana, so I presume, in, in, in Pali. Uh, yes. So what... I, Again, it's I presume it's an open question, but what what do you yes. think is these yeah, so when you, tell us about when that? you compare these various versions and even before the existence of the Gandhari work, you know, comparing say a Pali, you know, sutta with a Sanskrit and a Chinese or Tibetan version, less so Tibetan, but certainly Chinese, you know, the Venerable Leo has done a lot of work on this. You know, you you can see there's similarities and differences. Sometimes there's part parallels that you know have the first half of what in Pali is one whole sutra will be glued together with the, sec the second half of another preserved in Chinese and so on. So, you know, but, you know, there are many that you could say they are direct parallels. There's variation on all levels, right? It's essentially the same sort of thing. That is, it's the story, in this case, the one I showed, the, the discourse on the characteristic of not-self and at the Lakana Sutta, um, it's essentially the same text, right? But there is difference of sometimes the arrangement of material, sometimes whether or not a section is included or not. So the Gandhari version misses, maybe people didn't have time to see it, but I divided the text into sections, A, B, C, D, E. The Gandhari misses section D, right? And doesn't make a difference to the doctrine. So when you compare um, Sutta discourses particularly between so you know, Gandhari, Pali, Sanskrit, Chinese, there's very rarely differences in doctrine, right? There, it's the way the information is presented. Sometimes you can, and sometimes there are differences which may be due to different orientations of different schools, right? Um, so, yeah, there are, there are different ways of interpreting this. When you get to the whole collection as a whole, of course, you are witnessing developments in thought, you know, doctrine and so on. So we, we have, you know, I didn't talk much about it, that one text of um, Colette Cox. These are scholastic treatises, Abhidharma, um, where, you know, we find that ideas, even within the Pali tradition, ideas developed and ways of information being, you know, analysed and presented that is not, that's different to the sutras themselves. Not contradictory, but just different, right? And um, then the Mahayana texts themselves, right? Completely new ideas, you know, sort of familiar but new and presented in new ways. So the collections as a whole, um, when you analyse that, you definitely do see developments in doctrine you know, within, and practice and, and strands. Thank you. We have one question coming in from John Newman, who has several questions, but this one I think follows nicely here. So we have, you've just gone over some of the ways in which Gandhari changes to some extent, or even to a great extent, our picture of what 
canon formation could have been like, um, or at least how to rethink the history of the development of Buddhist canons with the uh, the knowledge of what this very uh, early material evidence for uh, uh, Buddhist writings, both uh, mainstream Buddhist texts, uh, suttas, etc., and uh, Mahayana material. And then also, of course, this question of doctrine, which it seems that at least for the the texts that do have parallels, that often the doctrinal content in the main seems seems to be similar. This question is coming from a, a, a linguistic angle, um, and the question asks: Does the Kandahari material shed light on the evolution of Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit? Yes, um, that's certainly the case. So. Very important for this is the, the Bamiyan manuscripts. So as I said, I showed you there was the earliest manuscripts from there, which we had carbon dated, um, sort of third century, something like that, fourth century. And then you, that's overlapping with the beginning of Sanskrit manuscripts, the earliest of which I think is Kushan's second or third century, right? So you're seeing an overlap of the the use of one language and script and, and, and the other language and script. Now, what's interesting about the Gandhari ones is that they show that the scribes are working in a Sanskritic environment. So they are starting to spell Gandhari Prakrit words in a Sanskrit way, but inconsistently. So, you know, for example, what's called the genitive when you show possessive, you say of a man, a man is Nara, of a man in Sanskrit is Narasya. In Pali, it's Narasa with double S, right? So Gandhari should really be Narasa like Pali. But in this area, they're starting to spell it with that little ending in a Sanskrit way, even though the main body of the word is still spelt in a Prakrit way. So it, we see this, this, you know, scribes, Gandhara and scribes working in a more Sanskritic environment. And very soon they're starting to shift. So this will, you know, helps better understand this process for those who aren't aware of the background to this question, which is that, you know, the Buddha, the language the Buddha used, they're referred to as Prakrits or the sort of common languages of that period. He, we think he died 400 BC, about that period. Um, this is distinct from, say, Sanskrit, which was really the language, the ritual language of the Brahmanical tradition, right? And the Buddha deliberately chose to use common language in preaching and not Sanskrit. And um, so for the very early period, centuries, Buddhist texts were composed and transmitted in whether one or other of these Prakrit languages, Pali being one, Gandhari another, right? The inscriptions of Ashoka, even in the main part of India, are in a Prakrit, Ashokan pra Prakrit, probably from around Magadha where he, his capital was. But somewhere around the beginning of the common era, that period, Buddhist inscriptions start to get written in Sanskrit or, or a hybrid form of Sanskrit. And some Buddhist communities start converting their manuscripts, their manuscripts, their texts, their canon to Sanskrit. Clearly, Sanskrit was becoming the sort of the learned language of, in, of South Asia. If you wanted to communicate and transmit your ideas, you updated your text to Sanskrit. So that's those Bamiyan manuscripts witness that. The earliest ones in Gandhara, all in Gandhari Prakrit, later period Gandhari, and then later Bamiyan, they're all um, Sanskrit, but with degrees of Prakrit elements, Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. Thank you. And to extend that timeline a bit further, uh, I wanted to bring in some questions that people have asked that deal with perhaps a somewhat later period in the same region, but after, uh, perhaps after uh, the period in which Kantaran was really, Kantari was really being used as a language. So as you know, many uh, people who are joining us here today are most familiar with Vajrayana Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism in particular. And we have a couple of questions that um, make connections between this this region uh, that you you bring out and later developments in Tibetan Buddhism. So uh, one um, audience member asked, could you please talk about the relationship between Gandhara and uh, Uddiyana, um, which in Tibetan Buddhist traditions is sometimes understood to be the birthplace of uh, Padmasambhava, sometimes located in the Swat Valley. And then yes. we have another question from Sonam Dorje 
around th that uh, particular image of a rock inscription that you showed that had uh, numerous languages and scripts being represented, it seemed, among them, Gandhari yes. and Tibetan. Are there also other instances where we see Tibetan inscriptions in this yes. region? Yep. Okay, good. So um, the first question, um, yes, I, I'm aware that Udiana is off sometimes placed in Swat, and I don't actually know the, the arguments to and fro for this and, and really where it sits. I'm, to, I'm not that familiar with the Tibetan tradition, so others could be you know, better informed to answer it. Um, and I'm not actually aware of the historical relationship between Tibet and, and Gandhara. That is, were monks traveling between this region? You know, certainly, you know, there must have been, you know, Buddhists were always great travelers. So, you know, there are trade routes and travel routes and monastic systems all over the Buddhist world. And, um, you know, we know that, say, Gandhara was a, a major center from Chinese sources of Abhidharma scholastic tradition, which is verified to some extent by these manuscripts, and that people would go there to study it, right? And um, whether that included Tibetans, I'm, I'm not quite aware. Um, you know, where the, the rise of the strength of, you know, when Tibetan Buddhism is coming into its own and when Buddhism is being introduced into Tibet, really starts to coincide with the weakening of Buddhism in that region, in Gandhara, right? So um, that's the best I can respond to that answer, to that question. The other one, which is the multilingual dimension, well, you know, it's Crossroads of Asia and, and those, those petroglyphs, they were rocks. It develops, the, because of the climate and the sun, it develops chemical patina and if you scrape that off you get the raw rock so you can write on it and make images now these are trade routes between india back you know pakistan with now pakistan and up into um, central asia mediterranean world and as i said the languages are tested there this is a those you know, those rock inscriptions you're looking at there's um, one of our colleagues jason nealis in canada works on a big project to preserve them to 3d them document them because some of those valleys have been flooded. Um, and uh, um, with Pakistan colleagues, Murtaza Taj and so on. Um, and um, uh, the language is there, Sogdian. Well, the Sogdians were major traders on the Silk Route for many centuries. Um, then there were, uh, this, besides Gandhari and Sanskrit, Tibetan, as, as I said, um, and then there's even a Hebrew inscription so showing the international character of, it's a bit unclear whether they were traders or monastics, um, you know, but on the, the, you know, this is how Buddhism spread. First of all, like that Kushan Empire said, it was very important to the spread of Buddhism to China. That's when, you know, the first Chinese translation of Buddhist texts happened. We have first witness of Buddhism appearing there um, in Western China. Um, you know, empire provides stability and encourages, which enables trade to flourish. And, you know, Buddhist monastics, Buddhism generally can move with traders, um, either as personal attendants or as, you know, missionaries. We know that, you know, from the very beginning, it appears that, you know, the Buddha encouraged his monks to go out and be missionaries um, to spread this Dharma. So, um, you know, Traders, trade, tradesmen, um, merchants, very important to, to both the supporting of Buddhism and the spread of Buddhism and those trade routes. Now, in terms of Tibetan, again, I'm not that familiar with those Tibetan inscriptions at that site, um, nor am I aware of any other Tibetan materials in the Gandhar, greater Gandhara region. Um, so in Bamiyan, I don't believe there's any Tibetan materials or Gandhari or Sanskrit. We do have Bactrian documents, but that's Afghanistan. Um, um, although you get, of course, many Tibetan documents in Central Asia from the Tibetan Empire there. Thank you. Uh, we're coming close to the end of our time, so we just have a, a few more questions for you, if that's if that's okay. And Please. one was a lot of some people have messaged me saying how excited they are about these kinds of uh, digital re repatriation initiatives around the really accessible you know online sources both for scholars and the the general public and one 
sort of dimension that's that's that seems to be really present there when when thinking about this this work is both a ethos of collaboration one that sometimes in the humanities is not so commonly seen and also a set of technological tools that can better facilitate collaboration could you speak a little bit about yes. those dimensions of collaboration yes yeah so you know one is it is the case that I think in scholarship, you know, in the early days of our field, Buddhist studies or, or Indology in a broader sense, you know, scholars would, articles and things would normally be single authored, right? That's less so now. So, you know, you saw, say, um, the that um, publication of the Pratyupanasamadhi Sutra, right? Well, this is Paul Harrison who did his doctorate on it. Um, Timothy Lenson, Richard Solomon, so they really provide particularly the Gandharan um, skills. Um, you know, Paul has access, you know, his, his authority in Chinese and in the Tibetan, so really gives that, knows that textual history. And, you know, that's more increasingly how scholarship is going, not always. So it's really, we have specializations and the best work is produced often by working with others who have other specializations and skills. It's also a pleasure to work with other people and, you know, talented people who have skills you don't have. Um, so, you know, that's, it's a great strength working in a group. And as you see sort of things you're witnessing today, say in the digital realm, you know, I could not have done that myself. I had no digital background whatsoever. But, you know, Ian McCrabb, who did his doc, he, you know, ran this IT consultancy company. He's great digital skills. You know, he did a, a doctorate with me on Gandhara relic inscriptions, just sort of for fun and interest. So then that's enabled us to work together. He couldn't do what we're doing by himself. I couldn't do it by myself. We, it's not just he and I. It's, you know, Stephanie Mature at um, you know, Australian National University, so I actually forgot to mention that she was leading the digital repatriation strategy. She was a former student of mine as well. She's the Sanskrit um, lecturer there. So <clears throat> each people, each person bringing different skills um, to produce a richer, um, better outcome. Um, and uh, the digital is no different from that. You know, most, most of our, our scholars, some call themselves digital humanists, but we're not really, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We have a lot of questions still uh, still coming in, um, <clears throat> and I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them. Let me just uh, bring out a few here. Uh, one is coming in from uh, Dhammadharini Tatalo Kateri, who uh, asks a question related to presence or non-presence of bhikshunis or bhikkhunis within this kind of textual material in Gantara. And uh, she mentions back in the first century, the Ekakuta Stupa reliquary scroll inscription of Senavarman, king of Odi, in yep. which there's marked this presence of the Ubhya Sangha or Ubhato Sangha, or the dual Sangha of Bhikkhus and Bhikkhunis. Are there any other kinds of evidence for anything like that within the Gantara yes. material? There is, um, there is some material um, references, I think in, <clears throat> excuse me, I believe that I would need to check it that, um, a scholar that was based at the University of Washington, Timothy Lentz, worked particularly on texts that are called Avedanas or Purvi Yogas. These are past or, or accounts of people's karmic histories. And um, I believe that in one or so other of those, Abhikunis, uh, Bhikshuni is mentioned. Um, now, in terms of um, content, so say, for example, in this new collection is a fragment of part of the bhikshu pratimoksha, the monks. Pratimoksha, for those who don't know, is are the disciplinary rules that are recited <clears throat> on special days, and they outline what, you know, what is good and what is acceptable behaviour for monastics. Um, so we have evidence for the monks, but not yet for the nuns. That's not, you know, conclusive that <clears throat> the nuns were not present. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, thing is with literature, of course, is that we know that the vast majority, we don't know who the authors of this material were until much later. Probably most of the material we have in now surfacing Gandhari, we have no idea who the, the authors were first, with the, beginning with the canonical material. But, you know, I didn't really bring this out a lot, but one of the very interesting things about this these collections is 
they witness the extraordinary literary richness and creativity of Buddhist communities, right? So I tended to work on discourses that have parallels in other languages. They would have been transmitted from the, from the Gangetic lowlands up into Gandhara and translated into Gandhari, right? Whereas others work, like Timothy Lenz, Colin Cox and others, on texts that don't have parallels. Or I showed you in this new collection, Richard Solomon's working on a um, new biography of the Buddha that has no parallels. We know from the meter, that's the meter of the, the verse, that it must have been composed in the Gandhari language. So again, it's witness to the, you know, the extraordinary rich um, literary heritage of this region, not necessarily richer than anywhere else, just happens to have been preserved. Um, you know, you go to Southeast Asia, it's something that, you know, Peter Skilling says has worked on a lot, you know, what, what are the Pali sources? You work in Southeast Asia, you know there are vast collections of, um, you know, of texts which have a name or are preserved in manuscript that must have been popular at some stage that nobody really works on or knows about, you know, but clearly were important. So Buddhists everywhere, highly productive, you know. Yeah. Um, did I answer the question or that was part of the question? Could you remind me? Yes, the question was on, on Bikunis, but I think in the oh, beginning yeah, of your answer, you're just, absolutely... No, I didn't finish what I was going to say, yeah. excuse me, is that we can't tell usually the gender of the author, never mind who the author was, but um, we know that, say, some sections of the early canon, the, the Terigata, the verses of the elder nuns, we think that that was authored by nuns. There's a count, male counterpart, the Teragata, the, the verses of the, the elder monks. Um, we certainly have discourses or sutras that record very advanced nuns, you know, in, in preserved in Pali Chinese and whatever. So they were an active part of communities. There's just not strong evidence so far for Bikuni communities in Gandhara. I think that there, there is some and some mention of maybe in the Chinese pilgrims as they come down, but um, in this new material, not yet. Thank you, thank you so much. <clears throat> so with with that, I just want to thank you again, Dr. Allen, for uh, your wonderful lecture. Um, many people have just written just just to say how wonderful your lecture was, and also uh, being so generous with your time and answering um, the many questions that have come in. And for those of you in the audience that asked a question, we didn't have time for it today. Again, I'm 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 sorry for that. We had many wonderful questions coming in and you dealt with them all so, so skillfully. So, so thank you again very much. Well, thank you for hosting the talk, Trent, and thank you to the Kensey Foundation for hosting me. So at this time, now that the event is coming to a close, I just want to bring your attention to the, the next uh, Goodman lecture, uh, which will be delivered by Tsong Sar Kensei Rinpoche uh, around the last Saturday in November. So if you're on the Kensei Foundation mailing list, you'll receive more info about that uh, shortly. And as always, uh, to stay in touch about upcoming events, we'll have more uh, installments of the Goodman Lectures in uh, 2023. Uh, please uh, visit www slash events and www.kenseifoundation.org slash the Goodman Lectures. So thank you all again. It's a pleasure to be able to spend this time uh, with all of you. May you all be safe and well.